in 1960, sociologists studied a random sample of 1,018 families that consisted of a husband, a wife, and at least one child. Of those families, 5.8% reported that the wife was a primary wage earner for the family. In 2011, the study was replicated with a random sample of 1,013 families that consisted of a husband, a wife, and at least one child. Of those families, 22.3% reported that the wife was a primary wage earner. Which of the following represents a 99% common interval for the difference between the proportions of families that consisted of a husband and wife and at least one child from 1960 to 2011 that would have reported the wife as a primary wage earner? Okay, it's a long. All right, so it's um, basically you're trying to um, find the correct representation of the common interval for difference between proportions. So um, here we have our our um. Our difference between sample proportions. So it looks like we're going to go from um, 2011 sample proportion. So let's say proportion 2011 minus the sample proportion of 1960. So that's our point estimate, plus or minus. We're going to have our critical value. Those are doing proportions. It's going to be z star. So we're doing 99% confidence interval. So we want to find the, the critical value with half a percent to each side of it. So it'd be 0.05. So point for 2.58. Yeah, so. And then you're going to multiply this by the standard deviation of the differences in those proportions, um, sample proportions, but the main thing is you want to be able to recognize this properly in your formula sheet. So here's the one I use, and if you look in this page, you're going to see that um, that we have our our standard deviations, our you know sampling distribution means, our standard errors. So it can all look confusing, but um, don't overthink it, I'll put it that way. So, since, since we were looking for difference proportions, we're just gonna look at essentially this row. And this is gonna be our answer. This is, this is if you have the actual population proportions, that's why it's P1 instead of P1 hat, but since we're doing samples, we're gonna use this. This is something different, this is for combined counts, that's for that's for a different case, we'll probably encounter that later. So we're gonna use this, and so the P1 hat, that would be our, the one from 2011, and then the, and the P2 hat would be our 20, or 1961. And again, you're given this formula on your formula sheet, so you really just have to identify it. So we did that, we found that in 2011, it was 22.3, so we had 22.3 times one minus 22.3, or the 0.223, 1 minus 0.223 is about 0.777. Sample size in 2011 was 1,013. Plus, then this is going to be the sample proportions for 1960. So same idea, except it was 0.058 times 1 minus 0.058, which is 0.942. Sample size was... 2018. So let's see which one matches up. And that's going to be C. The answer is C. All right, 21. Researchers working for a certain airline are investigating the weight of carry on bags. The researchers will use the mean weight of a random sample of 800 carry on bags to estimate the mean weight of all carry on bags for the airline. Which of the following the best describes the effect on the bias and the variance of the estimate rate if the research has increased the sample size to 1,300? Okay, so increasing sample size is generally a good idea. It helps you do a lot of things. Now, um, it will it's gonna it's gonna give you basically more precise estimates, more precise estimates. So that means your variance and standard deviation will decrease. So it's not gonna be A or B. C, D, or E. 
However, even though it may um may be a little counterintuitive, having a bigger sample size doesn't actually um reduce bias. It doesn't really increase it either, it doesn't really affect it at all. So for example, like let's say that um you know they're they're measuring the weight of these carry-on bags, you know, on this at the scale, on the scale at the airport. But let's say the scale was miscalibrated. Let's say the scale was weighing every bag five pounds more. It was, it was, you know, it was five pounds um, off. It doesn't matter if you measure a thousand bags or ten thousand bags. It's still going to measure each bag five pounds off, so it's still going to be biased. So it doesn't matter that we had a big sample size or a smaller sample size. The bias is not going to change. So um, it's going to be our answer is going to be C. Right, 22 researchers investigated whether a new process for producing yarn could reduce the mean amount of volatile organic compounds VOCs emitted by carpet from random samples of carpets the researchers found that the mean reduction of VOCs emitted by carpets made with yarn production by the new process compared with that of carpets made with yarn produced by the traditional process was 13 parts per million all conditions for inference are met and the p-value for the appropriate Hypothesis test was 0.095, which the following statements is the best interpretation of the p-value. Okay, so let's recall that the p-value tells you the probability that you would get sample results this ex at this extreme or more extreme if we assume that the null hypothesis value is true. So we always we always start we assume the null hypothesis value is true, and We assume the null hypothesis value is true, and we say that we would get we have about if they're not assuming the null hypothesis value is true, we have about a nine and a half percent chance that you would get results this extreme or more extreme, meaning that it'd, it'd be 13 parts per million or more. Because we're trying to, you know, um the higher the better. You know, the the higher we can um have this value, that means the more. Um, it reduces the, the volatile organic compounds. So think about like we're looking at basically a normal curve and this 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 um, p-value tells you that it's 0 0.095 here and that's 13 over here. The null hypothesis I'm going to assume in this case is probably going to be zero or something like that. Um, but anyways, we don't know. But what it's saying that so this is going to be that we have about nine and a half percent chance that our values would be 13 or more if we assume that all hypotheses were true. So let's see, not the not those. No hypothesis is true. The probability of at least 13 because it'd be more than 13 is that. So our answer would be D. All right, 99 percent one sample z interval will be created from the point estimate obtained from each of the two random samples selected from the same population. Sample R and sample S. Let R represent a random sample of size 1000 and so let's say and so if R is 1000 and sample size of S and so S is 4000. The point estimate obtained from R is equal to the point estimate obtained from S which of the following must be true about the respect and margin of error. Okay, so margin of error, when we're dealing with um, four proportions, is formally equal to like our critical value z star times the square root of our sample proportion times one minus our sample proportion over our sample size. Now, we're told that the the point estimates of R and S are the same. So the, our point estimates are our sample proportions or p hats. So so this value in each margin of error calculated would be the same. However, what changes, what's different is what's what's being divided by. So so for the sample R, we can ignore the z star because again it doesn't matter. They're both the same. For R, the top would be p hat times one minus p hat over the square root of thousand. 
for sample s, the margin of p hat times 1 minus p hat in the numerator, and in the denominator it would be 4,000. Now, since we're taking the square root, that we're not going to just say, oh, the margin of error is, you know, one-fourth the size. The margin of error is going to be the square root of 4, or the square root of 1 over 4 in the size. So the way this works is maybe let's do some math. Like only, that's only, we only care about the bottom. So 1 over the square root of 1,000, and we have 1 over the square root of 4,000. This is the same root, same as this, as one over the square root of four times the square root of a thousand. Oops. And this is just one over two times the square root of a thousand. So this is the so this is just one half of this. So then that just means the margin of error for r bigger one, this one's going to be, or you can say this is twice as big, or the margin of error for S is half, so then it's, it's, it's and it's going to be E, depending on how you word it. Or 24. Right, a study was conducted to evaluate the impact of taking a nutritional supplement on a person's reaction time. 100 volunteers were placed into one of three, three groups according to their athletic ability, low, moderate, or high. So let's, let's actually start with the diagram. So low, moderate, and high. Oops. At the end of six weeks, or so, um, in each group, they randomly decide to take nutritional supplements or a placebo. So within each group, you can say nutritional supplements, so we'll say N, or placebo, so P, N, P, N, or P. So at the end of six weeks, they were given a coordination task, and the reaction time for completing the task was recorded for each participant. And it compared the reaction times between those taking the supplement and those taking the placebo within each athletic ability. So, with, so within here, within each subgroup, they compare the results. So what's going on here is you're basically you basically have an experiment broken into blocks these are called blocks it's kind of like strata when you're talking about um, observational when you're talking about taking data observational studies but but here we have an experiment so we're gonna have a randomized block design now a completely randomized design meaning that they wouldn't even break it into subgroups. So our CR blocks are low athletic ability, medium, and high. These are the blocks, and within each block they compare, so our answer would be A. All right, number of tickets purchased by a customer for musical performance at a certain concert hall can be considered a random variable. The table shows the relative frequency distribution for the number of tickets purchased by a customer. So number of tickets purchased, one, two, three, four, five, and how often, what like proportion, what percent of the total time you think of. Each ticket costs $12. So what's the mean cost per customer for the performance? Okay, so in general, like when we're trying to find um, the expected value, so it usually, well, usually it'll be written in your book, it probably is large E of X. Sometimes you will use sigma, but um, you'll take each x value and multiply it by its corresponding probability value. So like, well, let's do x1 times p1 plus x2 times p2, da da da, all the way in this case, x3, x5 times p5. Now, remember, we're looking at, we're trying to find mean price. So we're not just going to put, you know, 1 times 0.2, 2 times 0.45, and so forth. Because this tells you number of tickets. That would be if you're trying to find mean number of tickets purchased. So 
since we're trying to find the mean price, where we can think of these as we can change these into prices. If you buy one ticket, that means you're spending 12 bucks. If you buy two, you're, buying, you're spending 24. 3, 36, 4, 48, and 5, 60. So our expected value for mean price would instead be 12 times 0 0.2 plus 2 or plus 0.45 times 24, or you could let's just go plus 24 times 0.45. Plus da 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 all the way to 60 times 0.05. So let's just do let's use our let's have our calculator do the work. So 0.2 times 12 plus 0.45 times 24 plus 0.1 times 36 plus 0.2 times 48 plus 0.05 times 60 and that should be our answer 29.4 and our answer would be problem D or letter D